Okay, I feel like a real celebrity now. This seems a little loud. Does it seem loud to you? No. no. Okay. Um, so, um, I, I am the author of this book, um, but I should say, while the words are mine, the contents really come, um, as Kevin was just describing, from Native Plant Society members. Um, so I, I was indeed, I, I, I wasn't one of the first members by a long shot, but I was part of the Native Gardening Group when it was small enough um, uh, that, you know, one person would bring the coffee and somebody else would bring the brownies and we sat around a single table. Um, and, um, and it was long enough ago that in those days um, you collected a couple of bucks each year to pay for stamps because the newsletter went out by mail. Okay, so that's the kind of thing it was. And um, we met, and, the, and you might think, oh, what a great idea. Someone was just saying this to me. What a great idea. Well, okay, it wasn't a really brilliant insight or anything. It's just that we met once a month. Um, and someone needed to take notes, and I was one of the few people at the time who had a laptop. So I took some notes, and I promised that I would write them up. <clears throat> So these are the notes from those meetings. Um, it just took me a long time to fulfill my promise. So the content, so I am an amateur, um, and I think the deep sense of the word, amour. But um, so there are many, many here who know a lot more than I do. Um, but I do have a feeling for how these things go month by month. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Okay, but as I said, the knowledge comes from others. So let me, um, you've seen a lot of eye candy, so I'm going to flip through some of this already. Um, we all, you know, I think are motivated in part because we look around when we go hiking or even just standing somewhere and are stunned by the beauty of California, and we want to bring it into our own gardens. And we have some Phasalia and some Cyanothus that we just heard are great wildlife plants. The, this picture was taken um, at one of the native, uh, our chapter shows, or tours, um, and so if you haven't already been on the native garden tour here, this is just a, a pitch, go on that garden tour, you'll be um, astounded at what you see, and if you read the descriptions carefully, you'll see that some of them are new gardens and some of them are old, and that's really important for you to know when you go to a garden and you say, huh, this looks like just a lot of mulch with a few little twigs, right, because that one was planted three months ago, or you go to one of the more established gardens. So. Um, we are here, I think, because we appreciate the beauty of what's around us. We love what we see in the California wilderness. Um, and we're practical, and we want to bring it into our own homes, kick back, look at it up close, hold it in our hand, and make it our own. Um, and so what I want to talk about is, is some of the things that make that easy. Um, and I do think gardening with natives is pretty easy, but I think it's maybe a little misunderstood. Um, so uh, let me just... Uh, lengthen my introduction a little bit longer to talk about how I think it's misunderstood. So I am going to talk about some of the practical things, weeding, watering, planting pests, mulch. We've heard a lot about trimming um, more or less, depending on your tidiness and your invitations to the, to the wild friends. Um, but let me talk, uh, let me, let me just talk about our, our sort of how, why it seems hard when it isn't really. Okay, this is, um, a picture, an illustration um, from uh, Carl Chapek, a Czech author's book called *The Gardener's Year*, um, and this is drawn by his brother Joseph Chapek. And this book is a lovely little book, even if you didn't like gardening. It's just a gem of a book, and it's beautifully illustrated. Um, and and once you've read this book, you might look at it and say, you know, how how could anybody else ever write a book on a year of gardening? Because it's so perfect. It's like the Fabergé egg of the year in the garden. It's really lovely. Well, the answer um, comes, from, um, comes from the cycle of the year. Now, I have this in here because um, I had this, this book was around the house when I was growing up. My father is from um, Czechoslovakia. Um, and he had in his mind, I think, Karl Chapek's world. So his, my father's, I don't know exactly where Karl Chapek grew up, but my father grew up in this little town called Klatovy in Bohemia. And there, you can see from this diagram how temperature and precipitation move together throughout the year. So blue is the precipitation, or mostly rainfall, and red is the temperature. 
And you can see here they move together. There's a cool season, and then in the war there's this warm season, and that's when we hear all these stories that we're kind of unused to here growing up in California about how the rain spoils summer picnics. Right? It doesn't, <laughs> or, or, what, or, you know, there's a storm during a wedding in the summer. Right? This is this picture. Right? This is. Well, here, right? These are the summer storms ruining the picnics. Um, well, that is Chapek's world. Um, but we are in Los Altos Hills. <laughs> and the picture looks very different, right? What we have is what um, we've sort of talked about in other ways and shown pictures of in other ways throughout the day. We, our plants, our plants, a lot of our plants love water. And they get lots of water, and you just can't drown them. Look at that peak. Right there, lots and lots of water. And they get lots and lots of heat. No problem with the heat. What they don't get is heat and water together. So I'm having a little trouble. There we go. So we have in the summer a lot of heat, and we have in the summer virtually no water. When we do have lots of water, it's pretty, it's reasonably cool. These are average maximum temperatures. Okay, so here we are in September, average maximum temperature close to 95. Right? Not a typical September day, but average, a tip, but a, a typical September maximum. So our plants have evolved with this kind of setting in California for a really long time. They're not used to getting rain in the summer. Um, and they are used to getting rain in the winter, and I think that that, that affects a lot of things. And um, the um, um, the picture that Sherry showed you of a plant having rot was because it was getting water this time of year. It was getting water when it was hot. So this is a piece of what drives the rhythm of our year, and what gives me the nerve to write a book, even though Carl Chapek wrote the perfect one. Okay, so this is, that was Chapek's world, this is Muir's world. Unless you think it's just Los Altos Hills, it's in Murphy's, right? Getting pretty close to Yosemite there. It's in Eureka, at the top of the state. It's in San Diego, at the bottom of the state. And it's in a whole bunch of places in between, Reading, Venetia, Napa this particular year is a little bumpy, but the still, it's basically California weather has an hourglass figure. Um, and uh, the rest of the world, not, not so much of the rest of the world does. Here's Los Angeles. So that's kind of my introduction that I think that that is kind of a unifying theme in terms of understanding um, when is a good time to do which kind of maintenance in California. All right, so let me start with where we are um, right now. The, um, the book actually starts in October um, uh, because I think, right, we all have heard fall's a great time to plant in California and the soaking rains are coming soon so we can plant so it's kind of a fresh start for all of us. Um, so, but this is, in my mind, a shoulder season. I'm going to have a slightly different take on watering um, than, than the, exactly when to cut off your sprinklers um, and, or drip irrigation. Um, but it, I, I'll have a slightly different take, um, not because the plants require different things, but because I'm going to talk about different aspects of the watering. So everything Sherry said is, of course, correct, but I'm going to focus on different aspects of it. Okay. Now, um, one thing I want to say is that um, so I'm going to, Sherry was talking about, this is kind of when, as a time, October, November, that's when we're going to stop, water, stop watering and turn our irrigation systems off. In my garden, this is when I'm going to start watering. Okay. Now that's because most of the things in my garden are already pretty established. And what I want to do with my starting watering now, there's sort of two things I want to do. One, I'm not, I, I can't help it. I'm going to be tempted to go to the plant sale and buy some more plants. <laughs> and um, I'm going to want to water to get things started. Um, so there's that. And then there's also, I want my growing season to be, I want it. I want to cheat a little bit and stre stretch out that growing season. And I don't want to have been watering back here a lot when 
you think, oh, well, that's when they need all the water because it's so hot and the days are so long, and that is absolutely certainly true of young plants that aren't yet established, and it's certainly true of riparian plants if they're not getting water because they're planted near a water feature that's spilling over onto them. Um, so there's lots of plants that actually need that, but in an established garden, there are a lot of plants that don't need that and are just going to be harmed by water once they're established. So as your gardens mature, you might find that you're watering less in the summer, but if you want to give them kind of a head start to bulk up, to get their, their um, roots, have a chance to grow even more before you get back to that dry season, then you can cheat a little bit because it's starting to cool in October, November, and you can start watering earlier, and that gives them a longer growing season without worrying so much about the kind of fungal diseases that you can get by combining this thing that our plants are not used to, heat and water at the same time. Okay, so I would say you can water if you like. Um, you can prepare to plant. Now, one thing, um, and you can plant. Now, we've heard this a lot, but there's one thing that I should say about um, my experience with the Native Plant Society. So, their um, number one, the most amazing thing is that the big hearts of the people that are involved with the Native Plant Society. Um, and what a pleasure it always is just to, to be with the members and just to go on the hikes and to be here at the meetings and, and always is great. But don't let that fool you into thinking that we all agree with one another all the time. Because <laughs> there's a lot of controversy and some of the, and a lot of controversy comes about these very planting things. So you'll have heard a lot of people say, plant and fall, plant and fall, plant and fall. But there are people who are going to say, don't plant and fall. And so there are exceptions to these things. And what I wanted to try to do in the book, and I'll try a little bit today, is to flesh out why reasonable people, experienced and knowledgeable, can hold different views on some of these things, like when to plant. And here's one reason. Okay, so plant and fall, but here's a big caveat. Bambi, she's a bit, he's a big caveat, right? because if you plant in fall, if you're in an area where there's a lot of deer, then, um, then you're going to be susceptible to deer browsing, because right now there's not a lot of choice for deer. So they're going to be looking around, and when they get, um, as I think it was Sherry talking about, how those plants... Um, that they come from the nursery. She talked a lot about the soil, but they come often when they come from the nursery, they're all green and leafy and lush. Um, even if they're going to be deer resistant, they're often, when they're really little, not yet deer resistant. So they might be deer resistant when they've grown thorns or when they have concentrated those bitter tastes. Um, so they might be deer resistant, and, and many of them will be deer resistant later on, but when they're little and leafy and they've been watered a lot, they're not deer resistant. And if you're going to plant in the fall and you live in an area that um, are, is browsed heavily by deer, then you, it, then you must protect your plants from deer browsing. And that's a lot of work. So you, if you want, you can either protect them, which is great, or you can just Keep your plants um, in, a in a more secure area from the deer for a time and wait until there's more lush stuff already growing on the hillsides, maybe more like January, um, where there's still plenty of water, there'll still be time for your plants to get their roots a little bit, give them half a chance before they face summer, um, but at least there's something else for the deer to eat by then. Okay. Alright, so and then having said that, I feel like I need to at least put a few things in here. Um, that are, well, I'll come back to this one, but that um, deer don't eat. Okay, so deer don't really eat much in the way of our iris. Um, they don't eat much of our ferns. They don't eat much of our sages. Um, here's our beautiful hummingbird sage. Um, and then, oh, I took it out. Right. Well, there's um, there are a lot, of, a lot that they don't eat. So. Um, so let me go back to this one, which is to remind me to talk about planting. So here, this, is, um, this plant is actually from Actera. We have a lot of beautiful plants like this one. And you can see it has a really nice, this, these are nice roots. Um, and they, um, they're not, they, if, I, if it got much, if it was in the pot much longer, then you know, it would be, they would be a problem. But right there, that's an, that's an easy one to plant. You can maybe just loosen those bottom roots a little bit and then follow the planting instructions that have already, that have already been discussed today. And so if you were, it, um, if you 
are going to say, okay, I don't live where there's a bunch of deer, or I'm going to protect, or I have a big fence, then you can go ahead and plant, um, and you can plant um, now if you water now. Right? Water ahead, and then plant. You also now must weed. So as soon as you have to begin to water, you're going to begin to weed. Um, and if you are inspired by something that looks like this, right? You're going out in the um, foothills or in the valley and you see these beautiful grasslands and our lovely annuals in spring and you want to bring those into your garden or into a meadow. Like this is, a, we talked about, you're talking about removing your lawns. This is a little tufty lawn alternative, Pastuca rubra. But if you want a be full of annuals or anything really you're going to plant from seed, then besides watering, you have to weed. Because when you're planting from seed, and particularly when you're planting from annuals, they don't have a lot of time um, to get established. Right? If you plant a shrub, then you, sure, you still want to weed. You don't want it to get overshadowed with weeds. But when you're planting the seeds, right, that you got these little weeds and the seeds, and which one's a weed, which one's what you wanted to plant, and it's really tough. But if you, if you plant a shrub from a one-gallon container or a four-inch, then you still are going to have to weed, but you don't have to be quite as um, fastidious about it. But if you're going to plant annuals or if you're going to try to plant a lawn from grass, um, then you have to be a lot more careful. And if you're going to try to do it now, then first you weed water, and then the weeds are going to germinate, I mean, and so then you need to weed. One thing that I find helpful, everybody has a different way of doing this, if you're not going to you know, do the whole smother and then um, uh, cover and deep mulch, right, which is um, a harder, more challenging if you're going to plant from seeds, then you have to prepare the ground so that our, your annuals and the seeds, if it's grass seeds, um, don't have so much weedy competition, they have a really good chance. So this is one tool, a hula ho or a stirrup ho, that you can use to do this. And so you first you water, then you the stuff comes up, and then you just sort of wander around with this hula ho all around the area, um, and you just cut those things over and turn them over. And then you do it again. Okay, so um, first, right, you water, it takes a week or two for things to germinate, pack it all down, water again, wait a week or two, they germinate, do it all again. It's not really hard. It's not like digging and shoveling. It's not like trying to take out pompous grass or, or um, scotch broom. It's none of that. It's just a little um, pretty, really pretty easy. You know, you put the brownies in the oven, you go out and you do this, and you go back, ding, oh, done waiting, brownies are done too. Right. Um, and then you do it again. So this is if you want to plant, right, the end of October, um, having grown up in California, I always remember the rains coming, I'm sure I misremember it, but I always remember the rains coming right around Halloween, just wrecking the Halloween. Right? Yeah. Um, so if you want to plant right after the first really soaking rains come, right, now is a good time if you want to prepare the ground, if you're going to be planting annuals, um, to start that water, get it all germinated, Heck it all down, do it and do that at two week intervals, and then you know right after you're bulging them from candy, then you can um, plant the seeds. Um, and um, you can also sow plants if you didn't you know do the whole um, difficult thing with all the not the easy but but more planning involved thing with all the um, mulch and calling the arborists and stuff like that, which is actually really easy. I've had arborist dumps on my um, uh, driveway as well. It's, but it's more like it's more carrying, right? You got to fill up the wheelbarrow, carry it to wherever you want, and all of that. Um, let's see. All right, and then of course to give already things that are already in the garden, you can go ahead and water. Um, so the next season, right? It starts to get wet and cool. Um, and there are a lot of things that happen during winter that um, are really cool in the other sense of the word. Um, 
That's also a time where we've talked about gophers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about gophers. Um, you might start to notice when it's wet, you'll notice a lot of gopher activity. Um, and same thing with ants. It's also a time where if you haven't already cut back a lot of herbaceous perennials, right? That, you know, all that stuff that looked great in the spring and starting to look kind of ratty now. Good time to cut it back. Great time to divide cool season grasses or iris, coral bells. Um, it, it, it's just great that it's a good time to do it because if you had to do this in the summer, it, like you'd never do it because it's like digging into cement, right? So um, this is really good that it's a good time to do that. This picture, someone today already mentioned bay natives telling a lot of special th specialty things that you, if you can't find them at the Native Plant Society sales, you can sometimes find them at bay natives. So he's got this picture of hooker fairies, fairy bells here that you can see um, getting divided, and it gives you a sense of how to divide a lot of things. So here's a big clump of them, and it looks a bit of a tangle, and indeed it is. Um, and here you can see how he's taken that big clump, divided it up um, into um, a lot of little pieces, um, and it takes a bit of detangling. And then here it is, um, a real close-up of that. So this is something to do when the soil is wet. Um, this is a picture um, from that Jackie Pascoe took. She is country mouse in this fantastic blog that she and town mouse have called um, Town Mouse Country Mouse. Um, if you Google town mouse, country mouse, and put um, Cal natives or California natives in there, you'll find this. Um, this is a picture of iris, and what I really like about this picture is that this pink that you see in there, how's the color on there? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty the, pink. The pink that you, it's maybe not really this pink <laughs> yeah, in life. Pretty close. Pretty close. That, that, and you don't see the, all that pink, because part of that is below the soil line. So you'll be looking at the iris, and you'll see just a little pink in there at the base, a lot of times well, in my garden, you have to push the leaves away to see it. Um, and, and, but people will tell you, I shouldn't have said that, because people will tell you you're supposed to make sure and plant the iris a little bit high above the soil line so it doesn't get all that leaf litter. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an amateur. I don't have to have it all so great, right? So that, um, the, but if you push away the leaves that, that are going to fall this time of year anyway, even for the most fastidious of us, then you'll see a little bit of that pink. Um, and then that's it there telling you that if you have a big clump of irises, it's a good time to divide it. Okay. Um, while I'm mentioning this blog, um, uh, a couple of people during the break were talking about another really good website, um, and that's the Las Pelitas website. It's a nursery. They have actually two nurseries. Um, and they have gone to the trouble of putting um, many, many pictures up with many, many descriptions. So. Um, I know a lot of you already have that beautiful Kachuma Press book by Bornstein, Frost, and O'Brien, um, and that is just invaluable. But you can also, um, on the Las Palitas, look up things like um, what to plant for various kinds of wildlife, um, and um, they have lots of lists, and I, even, I think they might even have a thing where you can put your zip code in, and it'll give you suggestions of what to plant. Um, they also have a list of fire-resistant, or uh, of a ranking of deer resistance, and then they have a list of time to burn of various plants if you're in the fire area. So these are just two great websites, the Town Mouse, Country Mouse, and Las Palitas. I put a lot of resources in here, but I didn't put any websites because they're sort of transient. So there's lists of books, where to see natives, and that sort of thing, but the um, Town Mouse, Country Mouse, you're going to have to remember that, Las Palitas. Um, you can ask me again afterwards, and I can spell it for you. Um, all right, let's see. Next thing. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about gopher. So this is um, a little gopher that um, oh, my daughter was like, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> and um, we fed it to the snake. Um, it's, uh, um, <laughs> half of it. Okay, so this is in here, and this, is, this thing has been touched on not just in terms of wildlife friend or foe, <laughs> but mostly friend, mostly friend, and um, I'm not, I, I did set some traps, I haven't set any traps in um, uh, at least a year, maybe two, um, because I have changed tactics to exclusion, okay. um, and I found that much um, more, more um, successful. Um, 
But what, what I want to say with this is I will talk a little bit about exclusion, but I also want to say that this picture to me is a reminder that while our native gardens can be low water, they're not no water. And while they can be low maintenance, they're not no maintenance. Um, and just like regular old conventional gardens have gophers, gophers enter native gardens as well. Um, it's possible they don't uh, go, they, it's, it's possible and quite likely that they go to bother my neighbors more than they bother me because they have more of the lush, yummy things. Um, but I've had that experience of looking out my window and seeing a plant like this. <laughs> like that. Right? That's, you know, that's not a satisfying view. <laughs> Some people like it. But. It's all right. And those plants were actually okay. I was okay with losing them. But some of the things I don't want to lose. So for example, I actually have a lawn. It's not a very big lawn. And it's this tufty, long lawn that's nearly never mowed. It's the Spasuka River lawn. But I don't want to have a bunch of mounds of dirt and holes um, from you know my daughter and her friends to trip over. Um, so what is underneath this is actually not drip irrigation, um, but um, is uh, hardware cloth, okay. um, and that's about I don't know about this far deep under the underneath there. Actually, maybe it's only about this. It's you know it's not. In some places it's steep, some places it's steep, um, and it's it's done a great job. There's actually some attempts from some things been trying to dig up from the top, but it stops and it all looks. I, I mean, I think it looks great. That to me is a beautiful lawn. Um, it's not to everybody's taste, but you can mow this one. Pasuka ruba can be mown if you mow it regularly. Um, which I've never done, but if you mow it regularly, I'm told you can get like a croquet lawn out of this thing. Um, so if you so if you have gophers and you have things that you don't want the gophers to make a dent in, then you can exclude them. And you can't see it's not in this picture, but the gopher the harbor cloth actually goes up the back fence a ways. So it goes up maybe about this high because the gophers will go over as well. Um, and that that there's an open space there, um, and I don't. And the other thing about gophers is, once you get rid of them, new ones will come. Um, so if you've gotten rid of their territory, someone's going to come back, and I just want to slow that down, because I think that's where they're coming from. Okay. Um, so that's gophers. Oh, and then and the other thing I do, which and, and I think a lot of people do, is. Um, there, you know, there's some bulbs. So I didn't see Stella Casey here today, but someone said she she's was here. here. She's here. And um, she's outside. So she, you know, people you know Sally for grasses and for bulbs. And some of those bulbs, she'll, she, she has a little display where, you know, this one is one year old, this one's two years old, and it goes to seven years old, and they're only this big. You know, and they're beautiful, but I want my bulbs to last seven years. And they, you know, we eat bulbs. Lots of critters eat bulbs, so I, um, you can put gopher baskets, you can buy gopher, pre-made gopher baskets, or I had a bunch of hardware cloth left over, so I just sort of make a burrito. Take my hardware cloth, put a bunch of bulbs in, and then fold it over. Um, and then stick it in, put the dirt over that. Um, so if you have some things that you especially prize, then um, use hardware cloth to protect it from the gophers. And chicken wire is not going to work. Um, and chicken wire, in fact, I have chickens also. Chicken wire does not work for chickens. <laughs> just, I don't know where the name comes from, but the raccoons can kind of unbend the chicken wire and get to your chickens. So um, I'm not sure what chicken wire is for, um, but hardware cloth is good stuff. Um, all right, Toyon. Now, um, this picture was taken um, by Jay Feskin, who is a member of the Reading chapter of CMPS, um, and we've already heard I think everyone who's spoken said something about Toyon. Right? This was taken up in Reading, but you all probably know, right? Hollywood got its name from California Holly, um, uh, hills covered with Toyon, this plant. So it spans you know, north to south, the whole state. Um, so why do I have it in this wet season? This is because in this cool season, and sort of the holiday season, is when you see it having berries like this. Um, and uh, you can, um, if you want to bring some of the berries in for decoration, 
you want to get them a little bit before they're ripe because as soon as they're ripe, you will have the best decoration of all, which is you know a couple of dozen birds um, making a ruckus in your toy on. Um, so uh, as soon as you see all the birds, if you want to save them, you better get out there right away because they will um, eat a lot of them really fast. Um, but it also, you want to wait until this, they get really ripe if you want to plant them from seeds. Not that you have to, because once you get a few of these in your garden, you'll find them volunteering. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit at the very end about how your garden over the years transforms itself and becomes a place where it will begin to surprise you with the plants of, that volunteer. All right, um, so how about... Um, Spring. Um, so with spring, um, I guess, I'm not sure if I put this everywhere. Let's see. Well, I don't have to go back. I'll just say, if I didn't put it in here, water and weed are pretty much all year <laughs> jobs. So anything you have planted, you'll need to water. Um, and you can plant anything you're willing to water. So even though we say um, in, um, in fall is the best time to plant, as Peggy pointed out, um, not everybody wants to plant in fall, and clients don't all come in fall. And I think it was Allery Middlebrook who wrote the, another book that's out there with Glenn Keeter designing the community, it's something like the community approach to gardening with natives, the plant community approach to gardening with natives, or it's a, mm -hmm. it's a long title. It's basically designing with natives using the approach of understanding plants as plant communities, but it, th those aren't the exact words, but something like that. She said she is, you know, in, in, she is in the business of designing and installing um, gardens for people, and she, uh, and I was, I was talking about this book with her, and, and she was kind of leafing through the um, draft, she said, well, this is great, Helen, but my clients don't all come to me in October or September and say, hey, November's coming. I'd really like to have my plants installed, that my garden installed. It. They come to me in March and say, my daddy's getting married in June, and I want to be in the backyard. Um, and, um, and she says, okay, look, we can do that. Um, and she does, and she does with things like, um, when necessary, with things like uh, um, with the native turf that you can buy. Right? You don't have to grow, grow your grass from seed. You can, you can buy plugs, you can buy one gallons, um, but you can even buy California native grasses in sod form. Um, whenever you are planting something new, you're going to have to water it because it's just going to have little roots. And that, um, unless you think that the sod is a way to get around having to do the hard work of weeding, it's not. Okay, so um, Allery and Stephanie both showed me sod um, that they had laid um, with a, I think it's blue Delta bluegrass sod um, with um, oxalis coming up right through it. Okay, so you lay sod, and tr you know, you got all this grass, really thick, looks beautiful, and as soon as the water comes, up comes the oxalis right through it. So you still have to weed if you have an oxalis problem. And um, so that, that is not enough of a barrier to it. Okay. I'm not suggesting that you use sod. I, I mean, I think sod is great and it has, it has you, want some, you want an impact right away or you want a little area right, up, right next to your patio, go for it. It's very, it's just, it's really amazing that um, natives are being mainstreamed enough that we have a choice in sod. Um, but it's also sod, um, I think it was um, Jeff Caldwell put it along the lines of, sod is basically a pot-down plant that you, if you get, you know, you buy a one gallon, it's at least got roots this long. You buy seeds, they can put their seeds down really easily. You buy it in turf and it's only got this long, which is okay, right? You can take care of that, just like we take care of plants when we got a deal, right? A plant that was too big for its pot, and we, then we unravel them and tuck them in and all of that. Um, and you can get what you want out of it, and it's a really good thing as, an, as one of the options. But um, 
Planting grasses from seeds is actually pretty easy if you do the water, hoe, water, hoe, water, hoe, yeah. And would you say with the sod, the key to getting those roots to go deep is to not mow together to get with the water? I don't know the answer to that question. Because I've heard that mowing is another way of also trimming the root because it sheds its roots when it's mowed. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to um, see. Um, uh, the only thing, I, I mean, I have not observed that, and I, no one has told me the observations of that. Um, I can say that I've seen lawns or, you know, meadowy things from seed and from turf, and six months later the seeds have looked, the seed-grown lawns have looked better than the turf lawns, but that I've only seen a handful of them. So that, you know, might reflect the care and maintenance that have gone into it. Um, so I, I, and I haven't seen anyone do experiments on that, and I haven't seen people do experiments on the mowing versus the not mowing. I guess I, I would, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, my guess would be that it would depend on what kind of grass it is, right? Because some of them, if you mow them, like the Festuca rubra, I know if you mow, will become more rhizomous, right? That is, so a lot of our gra most of our grasses grow as bunches, but a few of ours grow sort of sideways, like a lawn, right, with its rhizomes going out to the side. Um, and if, and um, it seems, but I haven't read any scientific studies of this, that if you mow them, then they grow less bunchy and more rhizomous, at least the ones that are able to grow rhizomous, like the Festuca rubra. Um, so it may get more densely, filling in more densely if you do that, but I don't know what happens to the roots. Yeah. Just um, real quick is, it depends on, um, especially if it's a native grass, you don't want to cut it too short, too much, too quick, because the roots have to get established. So if you let it grow long for a little bit, so that the roots can start taking root, uh, then you can cut it down to the four inches or so that is recommended for the plant. Did you guys all hear that? No. Oh. Okay, so just to repeat, um, uh, what Peggy said was that if you, um, when the plant is first getting established, then it needs, and correct me if I paraphrase wrong correctly, that it needs to have enough greenery up there to keep feeding the roots, so you don't want to mow it too early. Right. I think I want to also say that Yes, you can plant native grasses, and some of them can be mowed. But when you mow them, you do cut their ability to be drought tolerant. Because I think maybe what you're thinking of is when you cut out a lot of the photosynthetic capacity, then you know a grass that might have a two-foot, three-foot root system isn't going to have that anymore. It just doesn't have the oomph to make those really deep roots if you're cutting it a couple inches. I think that's... Well, except Logical. for, okay, and we'll talk a little bit about cutting back, um, like the Moulin Bergier, the deer grass, so, um, yeah. so that, the, there are some of them, a lot of them, I, I think, um, I think what Deb is saying is early grass. young plants she's talking about, young grasses. So once they get really established, right, our bunch grasses yeah. live decades, okay, and once they get established, sometimes they, they don't look like the beautiful photographs that we just had after they're 10 years old. And you might just mow them to the ground, or at least not to the ground, but like you might take a like a, a Moulinbergia, the deer grass is like about this high. You might cut it so that it's this high, like a little mound, and that doesn't do. So it, I was just saying, you might cut it so it's a foot high. That um, it'll come back beautifully if once it's mature. So after it's like I would say six years old, something like that, then you can do that, and you're not going to harm its roots at all. Um, and, you know, there's a lot um, of evidence in that situation that, you know, that had happened from fire and they re-sprout that way. So the pruning shears or whatever you use to do that with is kind of like a fire replacement in some sense. Um, and they are, many, many of our bunch grasses are appropriately managed that way. So you can, um, in fact, the Moulinbergia, the deer grass, and many of our other bunch grasses, a lot of times you'll want to take a rake and just rake them out when they get... They get kind of thatchy, and they're going to look much nicer. Okay, you rake them out, and then you'll see the light filter through them again. And they'll also have that beautiful movement, which is what we really like in our gardens, right? What do we, I mean, sometimes we see a garden that we like and we don't know. It's not just the plants. 
It's the quality of the light, and it's the movement and the sounds that you hear. Um, and if you have a big thatchy thing, then the light doesn't filter through, and the, um, and it doesn't you know move in the breeze and feel like it's alive. So you can rake them out, um, or and, and I'm not talking going out there every weekend and raking. I'm saying like, looks really thatchy. The rake's over there. I'll just get up, rake it out, and go back and sip my iced coffee. Right? It's not a, a big chore. Or then every you know few years you can actually cut them way back. Judiciously, I mean, leaving something. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so that was, where were we? Water, weed, pinch, select. Okay, plants and sow riparians. Part of that here is you can always plant and sow things that are going to get water, that are used to always getting water. So if they're used to being wet all year long, they're used to being wet. So things that grow in stream beds or along the edge of the stream beds that are always wet or in marshy places right, then they are used to that, and that's no problem to water them in the summer. And the reason that you normally want to water in the fall is that it's in the fall that you have a chance to water as much as you want, fall, winter, and spring before it gets hot. That's when you have a chance to water as much as you want. Whenever you need, when, whenever the plant's not getting water from the sky, you can give it water. And, you know, unless you're just leaving the hose and forgetting about it for four hours, you're not likely to overwater plants in the, in the cool season. In any way, it's really going to damage them. I mean, unless you're, I mean, you know, if you're trying, okay, you could do that, but it'd be pretty hard. Um, whereas in the summer, you do generally want a lot of our plants, particularly the ones from the chaparral, um, which are a lot of the ones we talked about today, like the Arctis, many of our Arctostaphylus and our Ceanothus, um, we didn't talk about the Fremontodendron, the flannel bush, with beautiful, big, yellow cups that's so, the flower is so big that you lose a squirrel, loses its whole face in them, nibbling at something in there. Um, the, the, none of those like much water in the summer. Um, and so you, you'll actually want them to dry up. Now, how much between waterings, but how much? Well, if you have a plant that has roots that are this big, right, and they're way deep, then you can let the surface of the soil get pretty darn dry, maybe even all summer, right, and not water it. But if you have a plant that's only this big, and it only has roots this big, then it then drying out means you know it's dry in this area, and then you can water again because it's dried out. That might only be a day, in some places it might be a week. And the water meter I've never used that. That is just the smartest thing. <laughs> I, I can't believe I haven't used water meter. How, duh, how obvious. But, um, but you can, you know, just take a trowel and dig, you know, just go, and then you can see that it's dry or it's, oh, it was only dry for half an inch, still wet, no problem, don't water it again, right? So I know people like to say, well, should I water every week? Should I water every two weeks? Should I water every day? Should I water once a month? Um, and I know that people that have helped you design and install um, can answer those questions for the specific plants and their specific sites, right? But it's going to depend on the drainage of your soil, the slope, and the, the, how much sun, how hot the days are, how long the days are, um, and, um, and what you've planted. Okay? But a rule of thumb is for many of our common plants, you're going to want them to dry out between waterings, but you don't want them to be desiccated between waterings, right? You want it just... You don't, want, you don't want them to be constantly, thoroughly wet all summer. So, and that goes for spring. Um, and that, but in spring and winter, if there are no rains, you still, you're going to have to water. Watering isn't a summer job, necessarily. Watering can be, and often is, a job to do, especially last December. Right? Last year, there was just, it was such a dry period. So, and, and in spring, it's still relatively cool, and if you want to really prepare your plants for the summer when it's hot, when you don't want to water that much because of a concern about fungal rot, you can help prepare the plant for summer by extending the spring as long as it's cool. So it's, you can prepare your plant for the heat by watering before it's hot rather than by soaking the plants, overly soaking the plants when it is actually hot. So spring, water in spring, um, and water more judiciously and carefully in the summer. 
Um, pinching, selecting. I have some pictures for those. Oh, weeding. Uh. So I just, um, this is just such a, the opposite of eye candy. I discussed. I don't know what you would call it. Oh, here we go. Okay. I don't know if you can quite see it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, that's people that have already seen it. Like, once you see these, your eyes see them immediately. Right? These are these little oxalis bublet, bulblets. Corms. Corms, thank you. And you don't want to leave these in if you can help it. Now, um, uh, who, one of you guys was saying you, you have to pull these before they flower? Yeah. Right? Yeah. But don't just think, okay, well, they're flowering now, I'm not going to pull them, oh. right? So like, just, I, just, I know that seems obvious, but just if you're still flowering, just pull them anyway, okay? Just get rid of them. If they're flowering, they're still, you're just there. By the time they're flowering, they look like they're on steroids. They're really lush. Feed them to your chickens. But um, you'll still help them get, you'll still, if you don't pull them even after they flower, they're just going to feed the corn some more. So go ahead and pull them. As long as you're watering, you're going to have stuff like this coming up. That's just, you know, until you've really got it. Well, okay. If you do if you do the really cool, all that heavy mulching, and you keep on doing that, that's great. And you won't have them call, coming up. But eventually, you're going to, you know, once in a while, you're going to get some of these things. And you need to water when, when you need to weed when you water. Um, uh, okay, so this is another one of the photos by Judy Kramer. I didn't name her earlier, but... She's in our chapter, Santa Clara County chapter, Valley chapter, and um, she does these beautiful close-up shots um, and teaches macro photography um, in Palo Alto. And um, so these are our tidy tips, and a lot of people put these in their garden. They're really lovely. Um, I have this picture. I looked at. I uh, I have this picture in here because I think it's you know part of what people like um, and want to get established, and it's easy to get. Um, these established if you get rid of the weedy competition. But I want to point something out here that some of you, I can see from your faces, are already seeing that took me a dozen times before I saw. Hmm. And that's this. Okay, there's weeds in here, right here. Okay. Now that, and here too. God, I didn't even see this one before. Okay. All right. Why am I pointing this out? I'm pointing this out because there will always be some weeds in here. You're going to look at your garden, you're going to hula ho or mulch, you're going to get some weeds. But it's still beautiful. Like, this is beautiful. Um, and, and I know George is here and has like a tiny tip on her wrist and a, like in a decoration. I don't see her, but no, she, I saw her outside earlier. Um, this is really, this is, I think this is a beautiful picture. And it's, um, and when you have these in the garden, you're going to have them. It's really easy when you walk by and you do actually see it to bend over. But if you're inside and you're looking from the window, just enjoy the flowers. Um, if it's all weeds and if you haven't hula hoed, these guys aren't going to flower like this. Okay, They're not going to get what they need unless you've gotten rid of the weedy competition. But you know, don't try to get rid of every bit of it. It's just a losing battle. All right, so this is... Um, so you have to weed in spring. This is um, from my old house in... Um, Mountain View, and this is the um, our native morning glory calistet, calistegia. It was so nice when someone said you can pronounce this however you want. Yes, yeah. It's freeing, <laughs> although it's still embarrassing to say. Um, and um, this is something that um, can grow, and it's beautiful. It grows really quickly, and we don't actually have that many native vines. Um, this is one of the ones that's very garden friendly, but it also can get really thatchy. So after a while, it, um, you know, it grows sort of like many vines do. It kind of grows on top of itself. And then underneath it just um, can be kind of messy. And so if you, um, if you find yourself after a few years not liking the look of it, you can, there are a lot of different approaches that you can take. Now, um, you can sort of judiciously kind of detangle and take out a few branches. Um, having watched to see, you know, what sort of living in there. Um, or I lived in this case um, on a corner, and this is a very long fence. And so I had four of these. And so once in a while, I would just take, I would just cut one of them almost all the way back. And that way I always had something growing and pretty on the fence. Um, 
And um, I didn't never cut them all back at once, but they kind of get refreshed. Um, and so that you always have something. And that's what a lot of our maintenance with natives is, is you know, you don't want to just whack everything all down at once. Uh, or you might. I mean, there's a sort of formal look that can look really good. If you have a bunch of bunch grasses, I've seen those geometrically, right? So you'll have like almost in rows, and then people, and they'll grow up in these rows, like a little, like fountains in rows, like soldiers. They have that at the UC Santa Cruz campus in spots. Really gorgeous. But then, and then when you cut them back, if you cut them in these little symmetric mounds, it's very, um, I don't know, very cool and chic. So you can do that if you like, but if you like a more relaxed, this garden has sort of a more cottage feel, then you can still keep your cottage garden feel, just cut one of these back altogether. You can, if you live in a townhouse and have a tiny little garden, you always want it to be perfect, right? Judiciously detangle all these. Um, but that's, I think, a tall order for most of us. So. But this is, you know, you're going to need once in a while to, to, um, to cut some of this stuff back. And um, while there's still some growing season ahead, is a good time to do that. For these, in particular, and for the bunch grasses, really. Okay, now, this is, let me see how the color on this came out. Okay, so this is um, our manzanita, our Arctostaphylus, the white. Um, uh, Ceanothus, the blue, and our beautiful red bud, the pink or red. So it's our, this is the American way, we're like, blue, here. Um, and um, uh, a couple of things I want to say about this. So I want to say something about pruning. I want to say something about um, wildlife. Um, and in particular, I want to say something about bees. Okay, number one, um, uh, you heard um, uh, Nancy saying, don't just plant one or, you can't just plant like a four inch pot of tidy tips, right? And then a four inch pot of, um, I don't know, pick your other favorite, Clarkia, yeah, say, and then a four inch pot of, um, of tarwee, right? And then expect, you know, all the pollinators to find exactly what they want, right? You want to put, if your garden hasn't had a lot of pollinators in the past, you need a big neon sign that says, here, here, welcome, welcome. Right? You need a big thing that says, pollinators, I have food for you. Right? So you need a big area, a big swath of maybe a single species. And you know, people have done studies of this for how much you need for bees. Um, and some people say you need 16 square feet. And, you know, there's different species need different things, and I'm sure it depends on what you already have going on in your garden. Um, but it's supposed to be helpful to pollinators to attract them if you do a bunch, big swath. Well, that's a lot of wildflower. But it might only be one shrub, right? One of these big sort of shrubby trees, that's the equivalent of a lot of wildflowers. Um, and if you put these three together, then you just, you know, it's three times that. And those are a lot, that takes a lot less weeding. Okay, this is a, just, right? so go ahead, because this will take a while to get established. Your first year in a garden, you might want to do the hoe and the seed, the hoe seed thing. Then, and, and in another part of your garden, you might want to do the, mulch thing and then plant some of these things that are going to grow up really big that you have to wait for, right? So you'll have the ocean of mulch with the plants appropriately spaced and then and then in the meantime have an area that you can manage of wildflowers that you can enjoy and get some gratification while you're waiting. And then these things will grow up and everything will just get easier and easier and easier. Shadier and shadier, but easier and easier. And then with these guys, right? Of the, uh, the one, um, okay, remind me, I have to get back to talk about pinching and pruning. But another thing about this is that, and um, remember what Nancy said about the solitary bees? Do you remember what she said they need? Bare dirt. Bare dirt, yeah. And um, then you'll remember what Peggy said, I think it was, no, it was, yeah, it was Peggy said about where not to put mulch. Maybe both, both, of, the, both of you guys might have said this. There, you don't you don't want mulch right around the base of the bark and stuff. Well, once you have a nice arching over tree, right? There's it's going to be pretty dense shade. It's not that hard to keep that weed free, and you can have that whole area under there with no mulch, right? And so then there's some bare dirt for the bees as well as the flowers on the ceanothus. Um, so there's um so the shrubs they. They don't, you don't get them, you don't get them in their full glory the first year, but they are easier maintenance kind of plants. Um, and they're good habitat plants. Uh, 
So, but pinching and pruning. So, a um, couple of things that. Um, but who's gonna pinch these when? Who is gonna prune them right when they look like this? Right? Right? It's just like I want some shrubs for flowers, but I'm gonna just whack off all those flowers when they're at their best. Right? Nobody's gonna do that, right? But you might take some inside. You might selectively pick a branch of the redbud, or you might have done it when it was dormant. So in the winter, you might have just that. Then the the redbud, the pink one, is leafless. Fairly dormant, really good time to prune that guy. Um, the ceanothus, after it blooms, or at the end of its bloom, that's a good time, if you want to make sure it doesn't get leggy, to pinch right behind where the flowers are. Because they can, they, some of the ceanothus bushes like that can get new growth out past their flowers, and the back of it can get a little bit bare. And if you pinch back, um, then that will... Um, uh, encourage the, the growth buds, not the flower buds, but the growth buds further back to grow. Um, and so it won't get quite as leggy. So after this is done blooming, then you can just pinch a little bit. And really, you know, like literally just pinch it off if you want. Um, for the Arctostaphylis, you might want to wait till summer, right? That's a, that's a more, for most of the, most of the varieties are, um, or most of the species are, are kind of more chaparral, and um, you want to very judiciously select branches that you might want to cut off to show off the interior bark, if that's what you like. Um, I guess I'm biased here. That's what I really like. I like the, I like the structure of the Arctostaphylis. I think it's really beautiful, and I think the bark is really beautiful. But a lot of people are all about the flowers and the fact that it's an evergreen. Um, and if that fits into your aesthetic better, then you can pinch those back as well, and it'll make it bushier. Okay. Um, so this is this slide is there sort of as a stand-in. It's not just eye candy, though it's a little bit of eye candy, um, but it's a stand-in there to say shrubs are great habitat. They're easier to maintain. They're not going to give you instant gratification, um, but they'll look really good pretty soon. Um, and then you can prune them in different ways. You can select to make them more like trees or more open to see their structure, or you can pinch back if you want them to be more shrubby and more bushy. Okay. If you're gonna pinch back, then you don't have to read my book. The cue is <laughs> that they're done blooming, so go ahead and pinch them then. And uh, don't pinch them when they look great. All right, so um, summer, precipitation. How am I in time? Is there Okay. All right. 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, the, um, so summer. Um, water wisely, right? Easier said than done. Um, prune evergreens. Um, deadhead perennials. Okay, so you'll have had some of those. Oh, here's where I have that sage picture coming up. This one. So this is um, Melanie Cross's garden. This is also on the tour. Um, uh, this is the front side of her garden, so it can be browsed by deer. But she said that this is the street side where there aren't tons of deer, but the deer generally don't eat the sage. Um, in the summer, you're going to want to cut this back a bit, okay, if you want it to keep looking good like this every year. Um, so the summer, one of the things you're going to do is deadhead perennials. Not till later, though, for your, or earlier or later, not in the summer for your Zoxonaria, because your Zoxonaria, or your Epilobium, your California fuchsia. Some people still like to call it Zoxonaria. Lots of people call it. Did I say it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello, man. Thank you. Um, that's that beautiful red tubular flower that, that's already been talked about to today, and I'll have a picture of it in a minute. Um, don't cut that one back now, right? Because that one's going to bloom in the summer. But for all those things that bloom so profusely in spring, um, then in the summers, when they start looking ratty, go ahead, if you like, and deadhead them. Um, uh, I haven't done this, but someone was telling me just the other day that she had a flax. Blue flax, very pretty plant. She let half of it go to seed for birds and for reseeding. She cut half of it back. She got the flowers on the half where she cut it back. And not on the half. She got a second round of flowers later in the summer on the half that she cut back. Um, and the rest, you know, was going to seed. So if you cut back the ones that are starting to look ratty then um, or unattractive, 
Well, for one thing, they might not look unattractive. You can let them go to seed. Um, and then they provide seed. Um, but if you don't like that, then you can cut them back. And you can even take that seed and go put it in another corner of your garden, and it still will um, uh, provide food. Right? So you can have a pretty part of your garden, and you can have another pretty but in a different way part of your garden that's a little more wild. Um, but if you cut them back, then a lot of our plants, even our ceanothus, will give you a second bloom um, in the, later on. So if you deadhead perennials, you get more perennials blooming. Um, watering wisely, what does that mean? Okay, um, I think I talked about the watering wisely. What I wanted, what I wanted to say about that was that um, there are some things you're going to water all summer. Um, and the plants that are used to getting water and that need water, of course you're going to water them, and the Kachima Press book will tell you all about which ones need water, um, uh, as will Allery Middlebrook's book. Um, uh, and hiking, going on native plant walks with the, with the Native Plant Society um, and in different areas will help you recognize where those plants all came from and give you that special joy of saying, ah, I have that plant in my garden, right? And then you even see, oh gosh, it really grows well with huckleberry or, you know, whatever your favorite plants are. And then you go back in your garden and you think, oh, I wonder if they have this other plant at the Native Plant Society sale. Right? And you can do all that, but it'll also teach you a, a, give you better insight into what the cultural requirements are of those plants. And so some of them you're going to water all summer, but a lot of them you're going to, as they get established and their root structure allows, and as their mycorrhizae relationships allow, they can um, withstand um, more and more, they can tolerate less and less water. Okay? So that one thing that hasn't been said, I know a lot of you already know this, but the mycorrhizae, these underground relationships in the soil that you can get from inoculation or just from having an established garden. It's completely contrary to everything I learn as an economics professor and I teach, but not completely contrary, but the roots, plants will actually share resources with one another underground through these <laughs> mycorrhizal relationships. You think, oh, the world is all about this ruthless competition, um, but it's, there's, there is this aspect of sharing and so that the, the plants, and it's not just in California, right? There's different microrhizal relationships all around the world among plants. And um, so once you get these things back to being established, they become more drought tolerant, not just because of these physical characteristics like thick leaves and um, long roots, but because they, they can share resources with one another. Um, and so, um, so I, that was such a tangent, I'm sorry. The, um, the, <laughs> The um, deadheading, pruning evergreens, watering wisely, these are all things in summer. You do need to water new plants, but as they get more and more established, you don't need to water them so much. Um, and you don't want to water certain ones as they mature. Okay, and then, uh, let's see. Okay, so two more slides, and then I want to actually read something from my book. Um, uh, this slide is in there um, uh, because this slide is purely in there because it, to me it's beautiful. Um, and, uh, and it's beautiful in a way that isn't something that you see usually in fine home, fine gardening. Mm -hmm. right? It's um, that tree in the background with that's sort of a glistening gray, right? that's leafless. Right, that is a tree, that's our California buckeye, and it's dormant in the summer. And um, I would bet that if most um, garden designers went out and said, hey, let's plant this plant um, in your garden that's going to be dormant in the hottest time of summer, people would say, Phew. and they'd be like, no, this is, I don't want this. And maybe, maybe we don't want it. And, um, uh, but um, this deer grass in front of it, and then in the foreground further um, is the, our, our California fuchsia. Um, I think um, it is also beautiful in that golden California way, um, with the buckeye behind it, right, that Mullenbergia echoes the shape of the buckeye, and the sun glints off of this in such a beautiful way, and you will never see this in England. Right? This isn't going to be in Sissinghurst or you know any of those places, even though 
I swear to you, I have seen our Fremontodendron espelier against a brick wall in Surrey, England, right? Um, and the same thing with Argaria and Arceanothus. I mean, they do everything they can to recreate what we have with ease. Um, and here is something that I think, with no contrivance, is, is, is an aesthetic that, that I hope that I hope that we learn to appreciate in summer because um, even though we can find California native plants that will stay green all year round, um, and there are many of them, and it's great to have some of them in your garden, you know, some relief on the eye when you want, particularly when the sun is high, there is also room, even in a, just a pot, for some of that rugged aesthetic that tells us where we are, that we're here in California, and that this is part of what we love about California. And so I have this in here because, because it is that end of the summer where sometimes it can seem relentless. I'm right, it's really, they say it's fall, but really, okay, it's not really fall, is it really? And, um, I mean, not like the season, the feeling. Um, only a few leaves have begun to fall. So this is, you know, a reminder that you can have an eternal spring, um, and we can have that in California with some water, um, but we can also have a piece in summer in our garden where we have this other part that we can, that, that, that we can love, like as our own, this is where we live, and this is what is represented all around us, so I guess that's enough. All right, <laughs> so two, one more picture. Um, uh, and so this is a thing to do that um, this is, a, in the very beginning, Peggy said, well, let's start out dreaming and then come to the more um, practical things. And I want to kind of come back to that dream because in Minnesota and in many other places around the country, it's in December that we have those bare bones of the garden where people are going to sit, and you've heard me say this before, but in behind a glass and flip through a catalog of bulbs, wipe off the frost on the window and look outside and plan and, de and dream. And in California, it's right now in that David Rains Wallace fifth season, it's called, that we can daydream and we can, and this is another picture from that great um, blog, Town Mouse and Country Mouse, in this case, this is the garden from Town Mouse and her shot. So um, I um, didn't include a recipe for um, uh, mojitos with yerba buena. Some of you said that you can make tea with it, but you can use yerba buena, muddle it with a little bit of sugar, um, add some rum and ice and soda, sit back in your, um, in your hammock, um, and then have a feeling for September and a beautiful afternoon like this. And I have to say, I really appreciate your being here and not in your hammock with your mojito. But let me just close with two paragraphs from the book about what September in California um, means to me as I've learned to appreciate it through um, the Native Plant Society. So September. School opens. Labor Day comes and goes, but summer clings to September. In the slowly fading season, some gardeners finish pruning chaparral plants and take cuttings of a few evergreen shrubs along the way. Others trim spent perennials and grasses, leaving the clippings in a low pile for hungry birds. Those with seedlings and young plants nurse them along with the water they need. Still others, that's me, sit back and do nothing but pass the time and leisure before the busier days ahead. In the warm, dry days that fill most of California, nature only subtly acknowledges the calendar's fall label. A few early migrating birds forage in our gardens for seed, deer browse heavily where they can, and the afternoon's slanting sun hints that dusk begins to inch into the day. Thank you. Questions? You covered it. All right. <laughs> I'm ready for our mojitos. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, really. uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. I mean, I want to thank the volunteers, but I really want to thank all of you because without you.